Welcome to the Radical Truth Podcast. I am your host, Glenn Meldrum, and this podcast is brought to you by In His Presence Ministries. Visit us on the web at www.ihpministry.com. In our last lesson, we studied Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 27. This is some of Christ's radical teaching on what it means to be one of his disciples. Though the old hymn, Just As I Am, is true, it's equally true that though his salvation is free, there's a cost to it. The word of God came to the prophet Isaiah in chapter 55, verses 1 through 3, saying, Come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread, and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me, and eat what is good, and your soul will delight in the richest affair. Give ear and come to me. Hear me, that your soul may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. The Lord is appealing through this message to receive from him what can't be bought, because salvation comes by grace, yet it will cost us everything to gain this free gift. The Lord severely rebuked the church at Laodicea because of her lukewarm condition. Yet he spoke to this church the wonderful truths found in Revelation chapter 3, verse 18. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire, so that you can become rich, and white clothes to wear, so that you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes, so you can see. The Lord was speaking again the words from Isaiah chapter 55, verses 1 through 3. He was calling a lukewarm church to pay the high price for salvation that's beyond cost, and that's why it's offered to us by grace. Jesus said in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. He's offering us a gift of infinite value, which is to follow him. This privilege is beyond reckoning, and the cost is to deny ourselves anything that will separate us from him and to crucify daily our sinful nature. These conditions are non-negotiable. The gift is free, so there's no way to earn it, yet it will cost us everything. The Lord went on to declare that if we want to gain his life, then we must lose our life by giving it back to Him who gave it to us in the first place. We must relinquish control of our life to Jesus so that He will be Lord over our life. We can't have His free gift of salvation if we refuse to give up control of our life to Him. I'm not going to go over all I taught on those verses, but just wanted to stress the costly nature of receiving the free gift of salvation that comes by grace through faith. After this important teaching, Matthew, Mark, and Luke recorded the next event, which is Christ's transfiguration. This is where Jesus supernaturally changed his appearance before three apostles and were given a glimpse of Christ's glory, which he possesses an in infinite quantity as God. The first thing I want to establish about Christ's transfiguration is that the three Gospels record an absolute historical reality that was witnessed by three apostles. This wasn't a mere vision, as many liberal theologians claim. Though the fourth gospel doesn't record this event, John was an eyewitness of it, and it seems to be alluded to in John chapter 1, verse 14. The word of God became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Years later, when Peter wrote his second epistle, as an eyewitness of Christ's transfiguration, he wrote in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16-18, we did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. For He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to Him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, whom I love. With Him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with Him on the sacred mount. Many commentators place this event roughly halfway through our Lord's ministry. I haven't deeply dug into this, since it would take considerable research to be able to give a good answer. One challenge to this idea comes from Luke's Gospel. In chapter 9, verse 51, we find an important transition taking place, where Luke ends this category of the general ministry years of Jesus to begin chronicling our Lord's final days as He sets out for Jerusalem. We have to remember that Luke wrote his Gospel in a scholarly style that divided up the history of Christ's life into five categories. The first category is about His birth. 
The second spans Jesus' infancy through his boyhood years up to the age of 12. The third category includes the preaching of John the Baptist, Christ's water baptism, and our Lord's genealogy. The fourth takes in all of our Lord's ministry years. The final category includes our Lord's last journey to Jerusalem, His death, resurrection, and ascension into heaven. This shows how Luke wrote his account of the life of Christ and why it can be hard to nail down an exact timeline, since that wasn't his purpose in writing the way he did. Since we are still studying our Lord's ministry years, let's continue in that right now. Another challenge we have is where Christ's transfiguration happened. My opinion is that we don't know what mountain the transfiguration took place on, and nothing changes whether we do or don't. Some strongly assert that they know which mountain this happened on, but they don't have enough substance to back up their claim. One tradition claims that the transfiguration happened on the Mount of Olives, but there's no support for this view. A tradition that arose in the 4th century asserts that Mount Tabor was the correct location, but there's little evidence to confirm this view as well, and that's why it's been rejected by most modern scholars. The present popular opinion claims that Christ's transfiguration took place on Mount Hermon, but there are some major problems with this view as well, which I will briefly mention. First, let's look at an overview of the events so we can get a better feel for what took place. Matthew and Mark state that the transfiguration happened six days after Jesus asked the disciples, Who do you say that I am? Luke records that it was eight days later. This event happened near Caesarea Philippi, six or eight days after Peter declared that Jesus was the promised Messiah. Jesus went up a mountain to have a time of prayer and took with him Peter, James, and John. This is when he was transfigured before them. The discrepancy in the number of days has to do with what point that the authors began counting. Actually, there's no contradiction between Luke's account and that of Matthew and Mark. After the transfiguration that seems to have happened at night, the four men slept on the mountain, and the next day they went down the mountain, and this is when Jesus healed a demon-possessed boy. Then they headed to Capernaum by going through Galilee. Though Mount Hermon is near Caesarea Philippi, which would make it a possible option, there are some major obstacles as well. One difficulty is that the mount was outside of Israeli territory that was populated by Gentiles, not Jews. Another challenge is that the mount has a heathen religious history, and this doesn't fit the location for a holy event such as Christ's transfiguration. Then there's the problem that ascending and descending that mountain would have been hard work to do in the allotted time frame. Jesus and the three apostles were able to descend the mount on the next morning and was met by a Jewish crowd, and evidence of this is seen in the presence of some scribes. This reveals that Mount Hermon couldn't have been where the transfiguration took place, since there wouldn't have been a Jewish crowd in that pagan territory. Besides, Jesus, Peter, James, and John couldn't have descended Mount Hermon in a morning. Now add to this that Matthew appears to say that the healing of the demon-possessed boy took place in Galilee, and Mount Hermon is proved to not be the location of this event. Some scholars make a good argument that the Mount of Transfiguration is actually Mount Jebel Jamuk, but I'm not going to take the time to lay out the reasons for this. I just wanted to present some of the preliminary information that relates to the extraordinary event of Christ's Transfiguration. Now we will dig into the dynamics of this event as we study the count itself. Luke chapter 9 verse 28 begins the narrative. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up into a mountain to pray. Jesus specifically took Peter, James, and John with him for a time of prayer. The reason for going to the mount was to have a time of prayer without the presence of people pressing on Jesus. We are told if Jesus knew he was going to be transfigured before he went to the mount. Whether he knew it or not, Jesus was obeying the Father's will to take Peter, James, and John on a prayer retreat on a designated mountain. Jesus often prayed in mountains to be alone with the Father. In this sense, Jesus wasn't doing anything different other than taking Peter, James, and John with him. In verse 29, we are given some more information. As he was praying, the presence of his face changed, and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Matthew chapter 17, verse 2, tells us how the Lord's face changed. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. The principal reason why this event took place was to reveal Christ's divinity to us in a totally different way from that of His holy life, teaching, and miracles. We are given a mere glimpse of the fullness of the Godhead that was veiled in human flesh. Even in this, the Savior was still veiling the infinite wonder of His glory that neither men nor angels could live in His unrestrained fullness. 
the glory Christ had before time and creation came into being, was bursting through his human nature and was being revealed to three apostles. In Mark chapter 9, verse 3, he doesn't mention the change in Jesus' face, but stated, His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. These three gospel descriptions of what Jesus looked like when he was transfigured is an attempt to explain something for which mankind doesn't have a point of reference. That each are bringing out a different aspect of it reveals their authenticity. They are trying to describe the glory of God, and how can anyone explain what that looks like? John in the Apocalypse kept using the word like in an effort to describe how the resurrected glorified Savior looked. Ezekiel did the best he could to describe the glory of God he saw as is chronicled in the beginning of his prophetic book. There are many examples of this in Scripture. The point is that they saw the glory of God in God incarnate, and their response shows how distraught they were over seeing more fully the true nature of Jesus. What isn't recorded, and would have been even harder to put into words, is the intensity of the presence of God that was in that place as the glory of Jesus was being revealed. I have been in authentic revival, and I know what it is to be undone by the glory of God, yet I didn't see what Peter, James, and John saw. I have been in a service where the holy presence of God descended upon us with such power that we were afraid to look up and see God. How do you describe such soul-shaking encounters with God? Nobody on this planet could convince me that what I experienced wasn't real or was just a figment of my imagination. These encounters have been burned into my soul and mind, yet I can't describe them in a way that would do them honor and justice. A very powerful lesson that we need to learn from this verse comes out of the fact that the transfiguration took place while Jesus was praying. This is extremely important, not because Jesus needed this to happen for his sake, but Peter, James, and John needed this to happen, and we need to learn from this as well. The principle is powerful and true. If we want to see the glory of God, it will only come through prayer. Passionate, desires prayer that's seeking after Jesus, not for our wants and desires, but for Him and Him alone. This is another very important reason why this account happened and why we are told the story. The transformation we need comes through prayer, for this is how we are to take all of our needs to Christ. But even more than this, it's in prayer where we fan into flame a burning desire to know Jesus in a deeper, more life-changing way. Apart from a desire and prayer to know Christ, we will never know Him beyond the infantile faith that defines the vast portion of the American church. It's in the place of prayer where God's glory can be revealed to and through us, where we can learn His will and receive the grace to live it out. Prayer is a place of dependency upon the Lord, where we rely on Him for our every need. This, and so much more, were the lessons that were being taught to these three apostles and is being taught to us today. Their responsibility was to instill these truths in others from what they saw and learned on that sacred mount. In verses 30 and 31 we are told, Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about His departure which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. I think it's interesting to note that Jesus was going to bring about this fulfillment in Jerusalem, not the Romans or the Pharisees and Sadducees. We don't know how much the apostles heard of this conversation or if it was told them by Jesus afterwards. Though they didn't talk about this event to others, as verse 36 tells us, after Jesus died and rose again, they were free to proclaim the wonder of Christ's transfiguration and divinity. There's a distinct possibility that the Lord talked to them about what happened before they left the sacred mount. The men were probably so overwhelmed from this experience that Jesus may not have been able to say anything to them for a while. The event needed to be sorted out correctly, and only Jesus could do this for them. How did the three apostles know that it was Moses and Elijah that met with Jesus? Well, there are two possibilities. First, the Lord may have spoken their names during the conversation. Second, They were given divine revelation into the identity of the two men. Since Peter mentioned Moses and Elijah by name when he offered to build three shelters, he must have known who they were at that time. We aren't given all the dynamics of this event other than what we need to know so that we can comprehend more fully Christ's divinity and how prayer is integral to us seeing the glory of God. Why was Moses and Elijah sent to speak to Jesus and give him some information about what was going to happen in Jerusalem? These men came from the realm of the righteous dead. Because Moses and Elijah supernaturally visited Jesus through the will of the Father, 
There was a glory that rested on them, and of course it was the glory of God. These two men were representatives of the Old Testament. Through Moses, God gave Israel the law, and Elijah represented the prophetic order. Their mission was to give homage to Jesus and to help the apostles understand Christ's divinity. The importance of this is that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Mosaic law and the word of the prophets. Both Moses and Elijah didn't experience death in the common way of men. We know from 2 Kings chapter 2 that Elijah didn't taste death because he was carried away alive in a chariot of fire. This is another type of rapture in the Old Testament, the first being Enoch, the great-grandfather of Noah. It's interesting how some of the prophets saw it after the body of Elijah, and of course, it was never found. When it comes to Moses, there is some mystery about his death. Some of the people of Israel sought after his body as well, which also was never found. Jude made an interesting point in verse 9, declaring, But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare to bring a slanderous accusation against him, but said, The Lord rebuke you. The original count of his death we are told in Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 6. He, referring to the Lord, buried him in Moab in the valley opposite Beth Peor. But to this day no one knows where his grave is. From this we know that Moses actually died, but Elijah didn't, for he was taken up into glory. Both men appeared before Jesus in some kind of bodily form, and I won't speculate on what this is, since I have no idea. We learn from this that Jesus is Lord of the living and the dead. The Heavenly Father gave these two Old Testament saints a mission to meet their Messiah, Savior, and God. They were to give to God incarnate a message from the Father about some aspect of what would take place in Jerusalem. Before this, Jesus already knew He was the Lamb of God and that He would die in Jerusalem as our atoning sacrifice. We know this since He had been teaching this to the disciples. What Moses and Elijah shared with Jesus we aren't told, other than that it had to do with our Lord's suffering in Jerusalem. Why the Father chose to communicate this way to the Eternal Son we aren't told either. Jesus didn't think that this event was strange, since he knew who he was, that he had come from heaven, and had other supernatural visitations as well, such as his confrontation with the devil and afterwards when good angels ministered to him. There were probably other visitations that we aren't told about, since they wouldn't be of value to our faith. The response of Peter, James, and John is stated in verse 32. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. All the travel it took for them to get to that mountainous location probably left the three apostles tired. There's also the possibility that there was a supernatural stupor put upon them by the Lord so that they wouldn't be frightened out of their wits if they saw everything unfold from the beginning. Another possible reason is that they weren't allowed to hear some of what Moses and Elijah said to Jesus because they couldn't bear it, so a lethargy was laid upon them. When they woke from their drowsiness, they were overwhelmed with seeing the glory of Jesus that far excelled the glory that rested upon the two witnesses. It may be at this point that the apostles were allowed to hear the conversation, and during that time they learned that Jesus was talking with Moses and Elijah. This event would instill in the three apostles' mind the truth that Jesus was the promised Messiah and the Son of God. This would be a support for them when their new faith was severely tested after our Lord's ascension. These three men would help support the infant church as it battled its way through this hostile world, and the transfiguration was a help to this. Then in verse 33, we are given some intriguing information. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. We learn here that Peter said to Jesus at the moment when Moses and Elijah were getting ready to leave. What their coming looked like we don't know, since the men were asleep and Jesus didn't tell us. And we don't know what their leaving looked like, because it appears that they were taken up when the cloud of God's glory lifted. The silliness Peter said was motivated by what we are told in Mark chapter 9, verse 6. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. I would imagine that in later years Peter laughed at himself over his response to Jesus at the transfiguration. What Peter said wasn't sinful, but it was irrational. The good doctor gave us some more insight into this when he wrote, He did not know what he was saying. 
In other words, the great fear that gripped the men was manifested through Peter's senseless statement. The three apostles saw Jesus talking with one dead man and another that rode a chariot of fire into heaven, and Peter asked Jesus if he can build them three shelters so they can spend the night. They were dead. They didn't need to sleep. <laughs> I seriously doubt if we were in that situation, we would have said anything better. They were all overcome with fear, and Peter didn't know what he was saying as a result. The shelters would have been simple structures to protect them from the night. One commentator suggested that Peter wanted to detain Moses and Elijah so that he could always enjoy their company with that of his Lord and Master, still supposing that Christ would set up a temporal kingdom upon earth. I don't really think that this is the case, since the men were scared witless. I think that Peter merely thought of being kind to Jesus, Moses, and Elijah by giving them a fitting place to sleep under the primitive circumstances on that mountain. The next thing that happened is found in verses 34 and 35. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and enveloped them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my Son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. Matthew chapter 17 tells us that while he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. As Peter was in the midst of speaking his ridiculous idea, he was cut off by another terror that gripped the men, and this was when the glory of God appeared as a bright, radiant cloud that engulfed them. The Greek gives the idea of a cloud of light, but there's no ability to describe the actual glory of God that enveloped them. In Matthew chapter 17, verse 6, we read, When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. This is a true, right, and acceptable response to seeing the glory of God. Peter, James, and John saw the glory of God and were terrified, but this is nothing new in Scripture. Ezekiel saw the glory of God and tried to describe it, even though human language couldn't reveal its reality. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 4 records, I looked and saw a windstorm coming out of the north, an immense cloud with flashing lightning and surrounded by brilliant light. The center of the fire looked like glowing metal. The prophet continued to explain what he saw and finally proclaimed to verse 28, And when I saw it, I fell on my face, and I heard a voice of one that spake. In Exodus chapter 16, verse 10, we are told, While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked toward the desert, and there was the glory of God appearing in a cloud. Then in Exodus chapter 19, verse 9, we read, The Lord said to Moses, I am going to come to you in a dense cloud, so that the people will hear me speak with you, and will always put their trust in you. When the Lord revealed His glory cloud on the mount of God, we are told in Exodus chapter 20, verse 21, the people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. The people's refusal to obey the Lord and enter His glory caused them to be rejected as being a nation of priests. Instead, the privilege was given to the tribe of Levi and the family of Aaron. Another account is found in Exodus chapter 40, verses 33 and 34. Then Moses set up the courtyard around the tabernacle and altar and put the curtain at the entrance to the courtyard. And so Moses finished the work. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. This happened when the tabernacle was first set up and we see that Moses' obedience paved the way for the glory of God to be revealed in a cloud. A very similar event happened in the dedication of Solomon's temple, and we read this in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. When Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. Obedience is a very important part of a seeing the glory of God. Then in Job chapter 38, the Lord revealed himself to the patriarch in a hurricane, and this is seen in verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the storm. The Hebrew word translated here as storm isn't strong enough, since the word refers to a tempest or whirlwind. It refers to something tumultuous or violently agitated, hence a hurricane. We aren't told how the Lord came to the five men in this story, only that he came with hurricane force, confronting Job over his self-righteousness that led to his blaming God. With Christ's transfiguration, the glory cloud enveloped Peter, James, and John. This picture is of a heavy fog wrapping itself around the men, but this was the tangible presence of God, and that's why the apostles fell face down to the ground, 
terrified. The holiness of God was the undoing of those three men. As they got a glimpse of God's glory and felt the intensity of His divine presence, they also saw themselves as they had never seen themselves before. The only right response to the manifest glory of God was to fall face down in terror. We must understand that the cloud wasn't a mere cloud to hide the glory of God, for it was in some unexplainable way the glory of God made manifest the apostles in a manner that they had never seen before and couldn't understand. The voice of the Father came from the cloud, proclaiming to Peter, James, and John, This is my Son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. In Matthew's account, the Father says, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. I would venture to say that the Father spoke it all, that he loves Jesus, had chosen him, and was pleased with him. The love within the Godhead is as infinite as God himself. The Father spoke of this love not for Jesus' sake, but for the apostles that they would know that the Father loved Jesus and was perfectly pleased with Him. This point would be important to know after Jesus was crucified and even beyond His resurrection. The prophecy in Deuteronomy that anyone hanged on a cross was cursed of God is about the Son being cursed when He took upon Himself our sin, not as the Son Himself that was always pleasing to the Father. Luke's account tells us that Jesus was chosen by the Father, and this comes through many modern translations that use the oldest manuscripts available today. The King James Version translated as, This is my beloved Son, hear Him. That Jesus was chosen refers to Him as being the beloved of the Father whom He sent to be our atoning sacrifice. As you can see, it's easy to reconcile the different translations on this verse. The account ends with verse 36. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and told no one at that time what they had seen. After the Father spoke, the glory cloud, along with Moses and Elijah, were taken from human sight. Peter, James, and John were left alone with Jesus. I would venture to say that they never thought the same about Jesus after his transfiguration. If they weren't convinced of Christ's divinity before this event, They must have done so after, though they couldn't theologically sort out what that really meant. Let me give a couple of brief ending thoughts on the transfiguration. This was a visible manifestation of the inner glory of Christ's divinity that was veiled through His humanity in a state of humiliation. This was also a revelation of His future state of glory that would be revealed after the Lord's ascension. The transfiguration was also a solemn inauguration of Christ suffering as a Lamb of God, where he finished the work he was sent to accomplish. This event confirmed the faith of the three disciples and prepared them for the great trial that was quickly rushing upon them. The two witnesses were representatives of the law and the prophets. They accepted Christ's suffering and death as a necessary condition for the coming messianic kingdom. This also reveals the unity between the Old and New Testaments, how the Old prepared the way for the New, and how both meet in Jesus Christ. It's interesting that the event ends with the disciples seeing only Jesus. Moses and Elijah, the law and the promise, have in one sense passed away as shadows. Only Christ remains, the only one who can forgive sins, reconcile people to the Father, and relieve the misery sin produces through the glory of His person. Here we are shown that Jesus is all in all. Thank you for listening to The Radical Truth with your host, Glenn Meldrum. We at In His Presence Ministries pray that this weekly podcast will be a blessing to you. Please tell others about it and subscribe yourself to this free podcast. Don't forget to visit our website at www.ihpministry.com. See you again next time, and may God richly bless you as you seek Him in spirit and in truth. Come wash in the river Come drink your fill Let healing walk